I feel sorry for Matthew. I really do. Having your best friend suddenly leave school like that, just up and leave your whole life, must be hard. Especially for a kid who's just started juniors. The thing is, Matthew's been acting out since it happened. Refusing to eat, not wanting to go to lessons. His parents were understanding at first, but after he lashed out and hit his mom mid-tantrum the other day, it was the final straw. At some point, when sympathy fails, you have to switch to discipline. That's where I come in. I'm the boy's granddad. We didn't see each other much when he was growing up, and perhaps because of that. Maybe because he doesn't know me as well as he knows his parents, he's always shown me respect. A little bit of fear, too. But that's okay. A little bit of fear can be good. I decided a story might be the best approach. Something scary, but with a moral to it. Something to make him understand that bad behavior has consequences. Matthew was huddled up in bed when I came into his room under the covers in his PJs. His bedside lamp was on and he had an iPad clutched in front of him. The screen cast a weak glow on his face. He'd been crying. I could tell that straight away. His cheeks were red and his eyes were blotchy. I felt a flash of sympathy for him then, but I forced myself to ignore it. Matthew? His eyes flicked up from the screen at the sound of my voice, but he didn't say anything. Mind if I sit down a moment? He shrugged, and I perched at the end of his bed. It was quiet in the room. Dark, too. The sun had set hours ago, and with the curtains drawn... Only a thin slither of streetlight found its way in. The bedside lamp cast just enough of a glow to give the room a campfire feel to it. Soft, orange light and large shadows. Did I ever tell you about the Warlen, Matthew? This was my tactic. Rather than talking to him about the way he'd been acting out recently... I decided to just jump straight in, let the story speak for itself. Matthew stared at me for a moment, then shrugged again. No. His eyes went back to the iPad. They sound stupid. Ah, that's a shame. I kept my voice soft but firm. I was going to warn you about them. I've heard they've been seen in this area, and I thought you might be at risk of getting a visit from them. But if you think they sound stupid... I put my hands on my knees and made to get up off Matthew's bed. This was a simple gamble, but I was fairly certain it was going to pay off. And I was right. I wasn't even halfway up before Matthew told me to wait. I let out a pretend sigh and sat back down again. Kids, especially eight-year-olds, are so easy to fool. Matthew might think he's a big boy because he's at junior school now, but the truth is, he's a long way from being immune to fear. Now, he placed his iPad to one side and stared up at me. What is a Wallen? I kept my eyes locked on him as I answered. A Wallen is a creature that lives on blood. Large quantities of it. Matthew's own eyes widened. Like a vampire? No, not quite. There are a few key differences. 
A vampire is more like a parasite, for one thing. They'll drink from the same victim over and over again, but only ever in small quantities. Warlands drain their victims entirely, every last drop. They'll drink and drink until the person's skin is so thin and shriveled, it's like parchment. There used to be a saying that if you ever asked the Warlan if they were a vampire, they'd just laugh at you. No, not me, they'd say. I only drink blood by the pint. I shifted on the end of Matthew's bed and looked at him. I could tell I had his full attention now. He was watching me closely, his mouth slightly open, his fingers gripped at the edge of the duvet. There are other differences too, I continued. Warlands can shapeshift. Not just into bats either. Their true forms are repulsive, but they can put on a second skin to disguise themselves. They also hibernate. Typically, a wall and wake every few years or so, spend several months feeding, then go back to sleep. By the time they're done, they're so bloated they could barely move. Their bodies swell up like ticks. I shuffled along the bed so I was closer to Matthew, leaning over him. The lamp on his bedside table cast its glow over me, and I knew it must be projecting a giant shadow on the wall behind me, a shapeless monster. But do you know what the biggest difference of all is, Matthew? I whispered. The thing that really sets Wallens aside from vampires? He shook his head, slowly. His eyes didn't leave mine. Well, Warlands only like the taste of children, I said. Bad ones. If they can find a really bad child, say, a child who refuses to go to school or who hits his parents, then that's the one they'll always choose to take. Because they know those are the children that won't be missed after they're gone. Shadows danced on the walls around us. Worry lines creased Matthew's brow. His eyes were big and round. I wondered for a moment if I'd gone too far. Maybe scared the kid a bit too much. But I quickly dismissed the idea. He had to learn. So, the Warlands... Matthew's voice was barely audible. What do they... How do they take the kids? I smiled. Well, the best way to protect yourself is by being good, of course. Then they'll probably go for someone else instead. I glanced up at the thin crack of streetlight filtering in through Matthew's curtains. But... If you're really worried, there are other things you can do to protect yourself. If you ever hear four taps on your window at night, for instance, then whatever you do, don't look outside. Four taps? Four. Tick, 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 tick. Just like that. If you ever hear a noise like that, my advice would be to stay in bed and don't make a sound. What happens if I look out? That's how they get you. You'd look out that window and you wouldn't see anything scary at all. At least not at first. You'd look down and you'd see someone you know well. Maybe a family member. Maybe that friend of yours who moved away from your school recently. Brian? 
Ryan. Right, Ryan. So, you'd look out the window and see Ryan would be there, same as he looked when you last saw him. He'd be standing in the garden below, staring up at you, waving. Then, when he had your attention, he'd beckon for you to come down and join him outside. Maybe he'd place his finger over his lips, too, to shush you, so you don't wake your parents. So, anyway, you creep downstairs, being as quiet as possible, and let yourself out the back door. The garden's dark, and you can barely see anything. It's all shadows. There's no sign of Ryan anywhere. You can hear cars in the distance, and the rustle of the wind in the trees, but nothing else. Then, just as you're starting to think about going back inside, you see him, Ryan. He's not in the garden anymore. Now, he's on the road outside your house, waving at you through the gate. As you wave back, he disappears behind the hedge. I wouldn't do it, Grandad. Matthew's voice was soft and panicked. I promise, I wouldn't follow him. I'll be good. I carried on, as if he hadn't spoken. As you go down the garden path, you're starting to feel it. The unease. A small part of your brain knows something isn't right. But... The rest of you is happy to see Ryan again, that you ignore it. Ryan would never hurt you, would he? Ryan is your best friend. So you go through the garden gate, and you turn in the direction you thought Ryan went. But now, there's no sign of him again. Now, the only thing in front of you is a van, and the back doors open. It's dark inside. You wander over to it, wondering if maybe Ryan is somewhere in that darkness. You're only two feet from the van when something grabs you from behind. Matthew let out a sharp breath. His face was a pale moon in the room's darkness. I could tell he was scared now. Really good and scared. But there was also a small part of him that wanted me to go on. Wanted me to finish. Just before you're bundled into the back of the van. Before you're taken away from home forever. You catch a glimpse of it. Your captor. It doesn't look like Ryan anymore. Now, you're seeing the skin below the skin. Dark, empty eyes, brown fingernails, and a mouth stained by so much blood that the lips are bright red in its pale face. I smiled at Matthew, reached out and gave his shoulder a squeeze. This was the important bit now. I didn't want to terrify the little guy too much. I wanted the lesson to sink in. Like I said before though, Matthew, the Warlands only visit certain kids, the bad ones. So, if you behave well and listen to your parents, you needn't worry at all. There'll be nothing tapping on your window at night. I smiled again and stood up from the bed. I was halfway across the room when Matthew's voice stopped me. I'm sorry, Grandad. Sorry for being bad. I turned back to face him. In the light from his bedside lamp, the kid looked paler than ever. That's okay, Matthew. I just miss him. Hmm? Ryan. I just miss him a lot. I told him I understood, then wished him good night. As I left the room, 
I felt another small pang of guilt, but I quickly pushed that from my mind. Accidents happen. That's what I told Matthew's parents. Mistakes get made. If I had known at the time the two of them were close, I would have picked a different child. He told Matthew his best friend had moved schools. That was the easiest way. Told him Ryan had gone to live in a different part of the country. He'll probably hear other stuff in the playground though. Even when they're young, kids still pick up things. But if he does, we'll handle it. I can always tell him another story. He'll never know. What really happened? It was a lazy, blistering afternoon. As my city is close to a body of water, the air is constantly very humid, clinging to your skin, nearly suffocating you the moment you step outside. I was about 18 at the time, delivering pizza so that I could have some extra spending money. I really enjoyed my job, and I was fond of the people that worked there. At that time, nearly everyone in that store was good friends with one another. I'd also weaseled my way into being slightly favoured by the manager, meaning that I could get away with a lot of BS. I often showed up late, or high, or both. Don't get me wrong, I put a lot of work into the place to compensate, so I more than pulled my weight. When I reached the store that evening, I was dismayed to find that the air conditioning unit was broken. Everyone in the store was sweating, cursing, and fanning themselves. The broiling heat from the oven meant that the store was almost hotter than outside. The back door was propped open. I remember feeling sorry for the teenagers they had employed to work at the front of the store, as they had to stay near the ovens for their whole shift. At least I got to sit in the AC of my car half the time. Everyone was relieved when the sun began to set. At this point, it was past 8pm and the store was getting increasingly busy. I had delivered to countless birthday parties, pool parties and your typical houses or apartments at this point. The pools were the worst because you had to walk around in the sun to try and figure out who ordered. Eventually, the customer usually notices me and approaches me or flags me down. Sometimes, however, I'm left hanging and have to call them or ask a lifeguard. This run was one of those times. It came in at around 11pm. An order of a single, small pizza, no cheese and all of the meats. The computer indicated that it was to be paid in cash upon arrival. Weird, sure, but I've seen worse. When I looked up the address, it became clear that this was yet another pool run. I recognised the neighbourhood and figured it was pretty wealthy, so I remember thinking that maybe I would get a good tip. It had been a terrible night. I arrived at the pool at around 11.30. I noticed that there was only a car parked in the lot, an off-colour tannish station wagon. Odd. Maybe it was a lifeguard who ordered, trying to wind down after a long day. Wouldn't be the first time. My heart dropped, as lifeguards almost never tipped. Usually, they were just broke teenagers. As I approached the pool, I could hear a splashing noise, as if someone were swimming, or playing in the water. There was no wind, and the air was still uncomfortably warm and oppressive, despite it being the dead of night. As I got closer, I realised that something was off. The lifeguard post was empty. No one was in the pool either. That splashing noise I heard 
was just one of those robotic cleaning things. It was making its rounds and occasionally pushing up out of the water a bit, only to fall back into the pool. I looked around, confused. Then, I saw that the office building, on the far right of the pool, had a light on. The yellow light bled through a small, grated window at the top of the metal door. Figuring that the lifeguard must be inside for some reason, I walked in through the gate, which was left open. I circled the pool cautiously, making sure to guard my steps when I hit a wet patch of ground. I already learned that lesson the hard way. At this point, I was just ready to get stiffed and hurry back so that I could take another run. And, in a way, that's exactly what happened. As I got closer to the door, a different sound filled my ears. It almost sounded like someone was rummaging around in the drawers or something. The robot was still spazzing out behind me. I didn't think much of it, and not. The rummaging sound abruptly stopped. I listened. Nothing. Just the faint hum of the streetlights in the distance. The robot splashed again. Now, I was really confused. What the hell? I thought about looking in the window, but I'd have to stand on the tips of my toes to be able to peek in, and I didn't want to be creepy like that. Before I could even get my thoughts together, the light went out. A chill went down my spine. This made no sense. Who was in there? And why did they turn out the light? Were they robbing the place? Surely a neighborhood pool office couldn't have many valuables. Was I about to get jacked? My mind was racing out of control. I glanced up at the window again and was met with the most terrifying sight in my entire life. In that window was a single human eye looking down at me, straight at me. And I swear, it looked as though it didn't have a pupil. Just a uniform, icy blue iris. I froze. I wasn't sure what to do. Then I heard it. A noise that sounded almost like someone gargling water, mixed with the most horrifying scream I had ever heard. The scream was high-pitched, like a woman's but something wasn't right about it, as if I was hearing it from underwater. Then the doorknob began to rattle and slowly turn. That was it. I booked it back around the pool, nearly slipping several times, my heart jumping to my throat every time. The robot was truly spazzing out now, continuously bursting out of the pool and thrashing around like it was having a seizure. I didn't dare turn around as I sprinted towards my car. Once I was out of the gate, I slammed it shut and briefly glanced behind me. The door was open now, but I couldn't make out anything inside. It was pitch black, a total void. I didn't see anyone chasing me. I didn't care. I was out of there. I jumped into my car, tossed a pizza into my passenger seat, and peeled out of there as fast as I could. As I was leaving, I couldn't help but notice that the other car in the parking lot had disappeared. This was extremely weird, as I hadn't heard it start or anything. I have no idea where it went or how it left without me noticing. On my drive back, I was obviously pretty shaken up. I realized that my manager probably wouldn't believe me if I told him what had happened. Hell, I wasn't even sure of what happened myself. I figured I'd just say that 
there was no one at the pool. That I had waited around, but no one was there. It's our policy to avoid abandoned areas like that anyway. That's just asking for a robbery. My manager was not pleased. Normally, this kind of thing wouldn't have been a big deal. But with how busy the day was, on top of the AC breaking and everything else, there had been a lot of screwed up orders that day. He angrily insisted that I call the customer with the number they provided and grilled me as to why I hadn't done that already. He blasted me, saying that we had wasted too many pizzas today and that the mess-ups were coming out of his paycheck. Damn, I thought. He was technically right. I decided to suck it up and call the number. Maybe, I thought. This was all some kind of misunderstanding. The alternative scared me, and I didn't want to believe in or even think about them. I typed in the number on my cell phone. It had a local area code, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary as it began to ring. As it rang, I prayed no one would answer. The second ring was cut short as someone picked up the phone. At first, there wasn't anything. Just an empty noise that reminded me of static. Then, it started. A slow, steady sound. Like gargling, like before at the pool house. But slower, deeper, more deliberate. Then, there was a voice. A deep growl, slowly pronouncing each syllable of a word. At first, I didn't understand but then it dawned on me. It was saying... my name. I jumped and quickly hung up the phone, my veins turning to ice as I stood there in the back corner of the store, shaking. I didn't know what to do. I told my manager that no one answered, and he shrugged indicating that it was water under the bridge. I then asked to leave early, as I wasn't feeling well, did a few dishes, swept the place, and bounced. I didn't sleep much that night. Today was the day. There was only one store in my city that did the upgrade. The attached doctor's office looked almost like any other doctor's office, but just a little slicker. All white, down to the computer cords, and of course, all the same type of computer. The anaesthetist talked me through the procedure. She told me about the gas and the injections and the monitors and the implant itself and how it was all so easy and I would be set to go the same day. Her bright smile flickered like an old tungsten light when she noticed my foot tapping and my hands ringing. You know, this is the last time you're going to be doing that, she said, her smile returning, warmer now. Doing what? Fidgeting, worrying. Our implant will help you take all those worries and just let them go, like balloons into the air. That's the idea, right? I gave her a nervous smile. That's the guarantee. We've tested it thoroughly. That's what I was told. Well, for now, I can give you a little something to calm your nerves. Is it safe? How much does it cost? Just me. It's going to be a very small price to pay to lose your worries. I guess that's the idea. The rest of the operation came in like a fog. I remember the mask she put on me. I remember getting the giggles before I passed out on the stretcher. 
Then, I was awake in a car, telling the driver where I lived. The fog finally lifted when I got home and sat down with a cup of tea at my desk. Should I really work right after having an operation? They said it was fine. They're professionals. I suppose, but... I found myself relax a little. What was I thinking? Oh, I should get to work. The day went by smoothly, even smoother than before. My numbers were up. I was moving through jobs faster than I would on my best day. Anytime I would start to second guess myself, that doubt popped like a little bubble before it really even formed. This is great. I've already made my budget for the day. I could stop and relax. But what about saving money? I should get back to work, just for a little. I ended up working another four hours. I wanted to stop a couple of times. But then I would think about rent and the future and my mother and what was another few hours anyway. Small price to pay to lose your worries. I sat down on the couch after work and pulled up my news feed. Headlines popped out at me that I would normally click on, but instead, I closed the tab. What's the point in getting all worked up? Why let the world get you down? I scrolled through TV shows. I ended up watching reruns of sitcoms I'd already seen. I knew they were good, and I want to relax. After a few episodes, I began to worry I was getting lazy. But, before I could really worry about it, I shut off the screen again and picked up a book. I'd been meaning to finish this one for a while now. As I picked up the thread of the story, I remembered what had been happening. It was a very politically charged plot, and a flood of remembered anxiety threatened to rush back in. I put the book down. Who needs that stress? I was bored. I went back online to see if anyone I knew was around to chat. I scrolled through the list of names. People I've known for years or decades. Friends and family and co-workers. No one felt right. I've argued with all these people at different points. Suddenly, I felt a cold knife of fear. What was happening to me? You should go online and look at the support page. This is probably normal. Sure enough, the support page had all kinds of information for me. There was supposed to be an adjustment process. I had read that before, but it seemed less important at the time. I was so worried about the implant operation itself, the medications, missing work. Now, I read through it more carefully. Some customers experience the concern that the implant is changing their personality or personal identity. This is true to the extent that we are reshaping you into your best self. This means that old habits that caused you unnecessary stress or overly emotional states will be discouraged. Habits that increase your joy and sense of safety will be encouraged. Who decided what to encourage and what to discourage? Experts. They researched this fully, to be sure. But what if they decided to discourage certain things and not others? Well, like what, silly? They want happy customers. So what if... I blinked hard. Something really important was happening. I was thinking of something really important. What could you be thinking about in front of your computer at this time of night? Maybe you need something for tomorrow. I suppose I'm getting low on groceries. 
I could put in an order for the morning. I turned off the computer, brushed my teeth, then went back to my bookshelf. I scanned all the titles, but nothing felt right. I sat down in bed with my tablet and logged into the library. But that didn't feel right either. It felt musty and old and... That's silly. I'm online. Why not go to Amazon though? They have better titles. I looked at the bestseller list. I noticed that the numbers were higher than they usually were for the top 10. I guess more people are reading these days. The same titles. They must be very good books. I scrolled through my saved list. There were a few non-fiction works I wanted to read. Economics, politics, science. But they felt dry. And what if the people who wrote them were wrong? I picked the number one bestseller. It was on sale. Small price to pay to lose your worries. I read through the whole thing without noticing the time go by. As I finally set my tablet down, I stared at the numbers on the clock. I should have been asleep hours ago. Take a pill. You'll be out before you know it. But what if... It's fine. Lots of people use them. I don't like this. Maybe you should write for a bit then. I grabbed my tablet again and started tapping away. I recounted my day, falling back into my old rhythm of journaling. The little bubbles of worry came up, but writing had always been a way to calm down and pop them myself. So I just wrote and wrote and didn't slow my fingers or reread what I had written until I had written it all out. And there on the page, if I looked out of the side of my eyes, but not directly, was a plea for help from a part of me that was being cornered and slowly flayed piece by piece. I realized I had just highlighted something and erased it. What was it? Probably just junk. No need to worry. I got up and started pacing. Why are you doing that? You should go to bed. You have work tomorrow. I know, I know. But something doesn't feel right. Something has been out of reach all day, and when I grab it, it slips away. I just want to hold it. It's probably not important. Well, it doesn't feel that way. Calm down. Get yourself a glass of warm milk. I sat down at my computer with my cup. I let myself type in the search bar without thinking too hard and just let my fingers go without looking and hit enter. Implant personality help. Happy customer. No worries. No problem. No person. Sat there when I looked up. What could that possibly mean? It's garbage. You should get to bed. I looked at the search results. Most were purple links from the support pages I had been looking at earlier. I hit a custom key I had created a while back to sort my results around Google's recommendations. They were quite different. Some people were saying the implant was dangerous. They must be crazy. Some were saying it was controlling them. That's just paranoid. Some were saying it was erasing part of who they were. The bad parts, that's the point. I felt like I was cornered between an invisible bear and lion. On one side of me was the worry that I was losing a part of myself. On the other was the worry that I was being paranoid. 
If I tried to think of one too much, I'd lose it. I had to think of both of them. Let them tug me side to side and threaten to tear me apart so that I could keep hold of them. The worry of losing the thought starts to tug it back if the worry the thought caused was threatening it. I have to be calm about this. Rational. But you're so tired. Go to bed. Sleep on it. You'll feel better in the morning. The thought of sleeping with the implant worried me too. Well, lock it up. The implant does its best work at night. When it has the optimal access to your subconscious, any adjustments that need to be made will be optimized as you sleep. Many customers who have initial difficulty find they have no issue after 8 hours of uninterrupted rest. If necessary, sleeping aids can be used to facilitate this process. Customers will find only one or two nights immediately after implantation may be necessary to enjoy optimal performance. Optimal performance. Happy customers. You should go to bed. Or maybe I should cut this thing out. That's insane. You're not a doctor. But I'm losing something important. Do you really know it's important? If you sleep, you'll wake up happier. You'll see that this wasn't ever really important at all. But what if it is? Even if it is, it's a very small price to pay to lose your worries. I let my fingers hit the search bar again, typing implant self-removal in a blur. I hit enter and the results came back from the support page, full of warnings and offers to speak to a technician. I hit my custom key and the sorted results had a few bloggers talking about how you can't remove the implant yourself. Of course not. That would be dangerous. But you could disable it by erasing the data with a decoser. Well, that's crazy. Where would you even get one? Online. Amazon has them. Can you get it in time? It's expensive. You'll need to sleep sometime. Can you stay up that long? I'll order it anyway. I need more coffee. That much caffeine is bad for you. Go to sleep. You'll feel better. But I could lose myself in the night. I could... I cut the thought off from myself before I could let it form. If I thought about what I needed to do next, I would worry about what it would do to me. And then I never do it. The bottle of Dexedrine was empty in one hand and an empty glass of water was in the other before I let myself think about what I'd done. How many pills were left in that bottle? Doesn't matter now. You could be killing yourself just to stay awake. A small price to pay to lose my worries. Now, I just have to stay up and wait. Portland, Oregon is a weird state, and most of the people living here will tell you that. Hell, the most popular bumper sticker is one that literally says, Keep Portland Weird. I recently found out, though, that the city may be a little too weird for my liking. There are a set of tunnels which run beneath the streets of Portland, known as the Shanghai Tunnels. These tunnels were once used by bootleggers in the Prohibition era to secretly transport alcohol to illegal bars known as speakeasies. That was a dark and probably boring time in an unusually sober portion of American history. But the origin of the tunnels is even darker. 
Day were originally created in the early 1800s so that merchants and sailors could offload their goods without disrupting city commerce. However, there was another, much more sinister usage. It's still debated by historians now, but supposedly it was also used to transport Chinese immigrants into an undentured servitude within the city. That's where the name Shanghai Tunnels originated, and also where the term Shanghai originally came from. Of course, throughout the years, these tunnels have garnered a bit of urban legend status. I've heard people say they've gone in there and were chased out by some malevolent spectre within. Others have said there is some mutant cryptid that dwells down there, apparently looking like a mix between a crocodile and a giant mole or something. I never believe these claims. Most of the tunnels have since fallen into disrepair or flooded out by the Wilmette River which runs alongside them. There are some tours that you can schedule to see portions of it, but they are very limited. Most of them are now off limits, but that hasn't stopped some people. Some people in this case was me and two of my good friends who thought it would be a good idea to go down there. I know this guy named Hector. He's a vagrant, uses a lot of drugs and lives homeless in downtown Portland. I first met Hector years ago when I was at a job site down there. He looked pretty miserable in the rain, so I thought the least I could do was give him 10 bucks. He was incredibly thankful for my donation and he's remembered me ever since. I've slipped him some cash off and on for years now and last week I was down there for work again. I saw Hector there, gave him a few bucks and he and I got to talking. He's an eccentric fellow. A few screws loose for sure, but he has a lot of stories to tell. Most of them involve some kind of conspiracy, like lizard people that he says run the government from secret bases underneath Antarctica. I like Hector, but I never really bought into any of his stories as more than fiction. That day though, I ended up mentioning the Shanghai Tunnels. Hector seemed to go stiff as I uttered the name. I don't go near that place, man. I could see the nervousness in his wide-eyed stare as he said it. Why? They're all closed down now, aren't they? I asked. Hector took a quick glance down the block and shook his head. No, not all of them. His behaviour really caught me off guard, as I'd never seen him act so reserved or look so nervous. If anything, it was actually hard to get him to stop talking. What do you mean? What's down there? Hector took another look around and ran a hand through his dreadlocks as he sighed. You didn't hear this from me, alright? I nodded, and Hector took a deep breath. I know a guy who got in. There's a spot on the eastern end where you can still access them. Not many people know about it, but the streets know all the secrets. I don't know what that dude saw down there, but it scared him senseless. I saw him afterward, and he was a wreck. He's always been a bit strange, but after he went down there, he was never the same. I eyed Hector skeptically, but I got no sense of him lying. Dude was found about a week later in a dumpster. He had a gunshot wound to his head. They say he did it himself, but... Hector scoffed and shook his head again, as he didn't believe that explanation. I apologized for the loss of his friend and tried asking more about it, but Hector wouldn't answer. It may have been a bit insensitive of me, but my curiosity had suddenly been piqued. Hector didn't say much more about his late friend, or what he suspected was responsible. But he did tell me how to get in. 
I bid Hector farewell soon after and felt the tunnels linger on my mind for the rest of the day. Like I said, I never bought into the superstitions about them, but Hector's story and the demeanour as he told it had me incredibly curious. A couple days later, me and my two friends got together for some drinks. We started talking and getting sloshed, and eventually the topic of the tunnels arose. I told them that someone told me about a secret entrance to get inside. They weren't buying it, so I, in my slightly inebriated and overconfident state, suggested we go see for ourselves. My two friends, Chris and Devon, are very much the adventurous type. They've been on urban exploration trips in abandoned locales many times before and are generally the types that are up for just about anything. As soon as I'd spoken my challenge to them, they jumped all over it. Next thing I know, we were on our way down to the location. It was late at night and we had packed all the gear we thought we would need. Devon drove as I sat in the front passenger seat and gave him directions. Half an hour later, and we pulled into this run-down lot in eastern Portland. The place looked abandoned, some old warehouse that had sat unused for quite a while. Its architecture looked quite old, and that was a good sign for us. The tunnels connect to dozens of old buildings in the area, many older hotels, markets, and even some homes have entrances in the basements to gain access to the tunnels. Like I said earlier, most have been sealed up by this point, but apparently, not all of them. I felt a cold chill creep down my spine as Chris and Devon strapped on their equipment. I knew being there was a bad idea, even without seeing the foreboding building and plethora of trespassing signs. Yet despite that, I was determined to see the elusive tunnels for myself. We hopped the fence and made our way through the lot and towards the chained up door. Luckily, it was mostly for optics and we were able to slide right between it and the rusted metal door. Once inside, I felt a blanket of dust fall around us. Chris shined his flashlight around, illuminating several empty corridors. Old crates and piled up garbage filled the floors, and the walls were decorated with all manner of graffiti. The two of them didn't so much as hesitate, and quickly moved through the forsaken building to try and find the entrance. I did my best to recall Hector's instructions, and within a couple minutes, we found the stairs that led to the basement. Chris went first, with Devon following behind and me bringing up the rear. The basement was in an even more abysmal condition than the ground floor. It was mostly clear of trash, but the walls were all but completely covered in all sorts of strange graffiti. Most of it was the usual gang signs and praises of Satan and whatnot. But there was one image that seemed to stand out. It looked like a butterfly, painted black with splotches of blue within it. It must have been scrawled on at least a dozen different places. After wandering around for a few minutes, Devon called out to us from the side. Chris and I turned to see Devon's flashlight illuminating a large hole in the wall. It looked like there had once been a door there, but someone had knocked it clear out of its frame, leaving only a gaping concrete hole. Dozens of the same image of a butterfly were painted around the hole, varying in size from only a couple of inches to several feet. Devon approached the hole and shined his flashlight through it. I crept up behind him and saw a dark, narrow corridor on the other side. The ground was wet 
and somewhere in the distance, I heard what sounded like running water. A cold chill swept down my spine as I eyed the long, desolate passage. Even in that moment, it felt like a bad idea. But Ego wouldn't let me say it. Devon stepped through the hole, as if completely unaffected by the foreboding scene. Chris followed a moment later, and I reluctantly did as well. Both Chris and Devon have extensive experience in exploration and splunking, and I chose to trust them rather than my gut. The three of us made our way into the tunnel, taking care to remain as silent as possible while observing all that we could. It felt like we were walking into a crypt and straying deeper into some place that had not seen the light of day in decades. The tunnel eventually branched, and two other passages sat opposite either end. One was partially caved in with rubble and wood splinters, while the other two remained mostly intact. We were about to venture down the left-hand passage when Chris called out, Hey, look at this! I turned and saw Chris waving us towards the collapsed tunnel. He was knelt beside it, shining his flashlight into the pile. Something shimmered within it. Chris put his hand in as the two of us approached and pulled up a small metallic chain with a heart-shaped locket. It was quite rusted, but there appeared to be a word engraved upon it. Desiree. Chris read the name and looked back to us. I wonder where she went? A small grin crept across his face, but neither of us responded. He got back to his feet, and the three of us pushed onward. A couple of minutes later, as we were walking down another separate concrete hallway, Devon suddenly paused. He held up a hand, motioning us to freeze and be silent. We stayed put for several seconds, but I didn't hear anything. What is it? Chris finally asked in a whisper. Devon remained silent a couple more seconds, then shook his head slowly. Nothing, I guess. I saw a brief look of concern flash across his face, but I said nothing. By that point, we had travelled pretty deep into the tunnels, and I was desperately wanting to turn back. I didn't though. I refused to be the one to back out first, as I knew neither Chris or Devon would ever have let me live it down. We pushed on around another corner and into a wide open chamber. A few rats scurried away as we entered, and the sounds of flowing water had grown louder. Around the room, there were old garments of clothing scattered about. They were filthy and looked as though they had been there a very long time. The three of us spread out in the room and began to inspect the area. I saw old jeans, a couple pairs of shoes and other random articles of clothing. The place smelled terrible too, like mildew and sewage. I was finally about to suggest we head back when something on the wall caught my attention. Another drawing of a butterfly. I felt my heart sort of recoil in my chest as I beheld the uncanny depiction. I can't even fully explain why, but something about it was almost haunting to me. Maybe it was just the environment that did it, but I could have sworn I recognised that image from somewhere. I don't think we should be here, Devon suddenly spoke in a whisper. I turned back and saw him facing away from me a couple yards away. 
Chris looked back from the other side, and he and I exchanged a confused look. Chris then chuckled. Too spooky for you, huh? Chris asked. Devon didn't reply. He just lifted a hand and pointed to something in front of him. My heart began to pump furiously, and I quickly walked over to Devon's side. That's when I saw it. On the ground where Devon was pointing was a random assortment of what I initially thought were smooth, slender rocks. It took me only a second to recognize what they actually were. Bones. A large pile of bones. Chris saw it too, but he just scoffed. You guys are letting this place get to you. It's just the remains of some animal. Devon immediately shook his head and picked up a piece of rebar from the ground. He then began to prod the pile until one unique piece of bone fluttered out. There was no question anymore, as the small, curved bone was unmistakably the lower jaw of a human. Chris didn't have an answer for that one. None of us did, and we just stood there in a stunned silence for a moment. I swear it became so quiet I could hear my blood pumping through my veins. I then realized how vast that pile of bones truly was, and I knew it was way too large to belong to only a single person. Suddenly, there was a loud bang that reverberated through the cavern. It sounded like a metal door slamming hard against its frame. The sudden calamity caused me to jump, and the three of us stepped back to gaze down the tunnel where the noise had originated. In the distance, I began to hear the ever so slight sound of footsteps, wet and flapping against the wet, squalid ground. They were coming towards us. Let's get the hell out of here, Chris suddenly spoke. We turned to do just that, but Devon continued to stare. The footsteps then suddenly halted down the labyrinthian corridor ahead of us. A vague silhouette suddenly emerged from the shadows. I always thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Until it moved. In a split second, we lost all sense of rationale and composure, and the three of us panicked and lurched into a full sprint. All our thoughts of exploration vanished immediately as our minds flooded with adrenaline and terror. I ran as fast and as frantic as I ever have in my life. We rounded the corner to retrace our steps back, using only our measly flashlights to guide our way. Chris and Devon were ahead of me, and suddenly, I felt my foot fall on something unstable. I felt my ankle twist and give out beneath me with a painful crack before plummeting hard into the wet ground. My phone fell from my hand, landing so hard that I heard it shatter on impact. Chris and Devon didn't hesitate, and within seconds, I watched their lights disappear down the corridor. I screamed out for them, but they must have not heard me. As my only source of light had broken, I found myself alone in the dark, but not as alone as I would have liked. I tried hauling myself to my feet, hoping the adrenaline would be enough to overcome the searing pain in my mangled ankle, but it wasn't. My jaw clamped down hard and I fell back down to the ground with a whimper. I was about to try again, driven by the terror I felt, when I heard a rock scamper across the ground somewhere behind me. 
I froze and felt my hands trembling beneath me. Footsteps echoed behind me and I could do nothing in my injured state aside from try to remain hidden and pray. I knew it wouldn't work and whatever it was seemed to know exactly where I was, even in the pitch black. It strolled up right behind me, stopping just a couple feet away. I learned the true meaning of deer in the headlights in that moment as I found myself so absolutely petrified that I couldn't even move. Please, I'm sorry, I'll never come back, I promise. Please, just let me go. My words echoed throughout the dark halls, but there was no response. I thought I was about to be murdered by some deranged sewer-dwelling lunatic or torn apart by some otherworldly entity. It took a few more steps towards me. Suddenly, I felt something grab my shoulder. It was cold. So unbelievably cold that it almost felt like a hornet sting against my skin. It gripped down tighter, causing an immense pressure against my skin. It may have been just my frantic mind trying to cope with the traumatic situation, but I could have sworn I felt something then. It was something more than a physical pain, deeper and more personal, like someone allowed me a glimpse into the depths of their soul. I can't explain it. Get out. They'll find you. The voice that had spoken sounded like that of a young girl, not threatening or malicious in any way. If anything, it sounded like a voice filled with despair, an all-encompassing sorrow that I suppose I could never fully comprehend. She then let go of my shoulder, taking the pain with her as the footsteps sauntered away back into the tunnel. Once again, I was alone in the dark. All I could do was to just sit there and contemplate what I had just witnessed. After a few minutes, I think the shock began to wear off, and I heard another noise down the tunnel. This time, it came from the opposite direction, accompanied by a light. Zack? Zack? Holy crap, you alright? It was Devon. But I didn't know how to respond. He knelt down to help me to my feet. I felt my ankle creak as I moved it, and a nerve shot an immense pain through my leg. I would have fallen back down if he hadn't been holding me up. We turned to leave that place, when I saw his light flash off something on the ground behind us. Wait, what is that? I asked. Devon turned back, and the two of us stared down at the silver ring laying on the ground. It was worn pretty heavily, and beside it, I noticed two bare footprints in the muck. Devon wanted to leave, but I demanded he let me grab the ring first. Devon hauled me back outside, and we found Chris waiting for us on the middle floor. The two of them guided me back to the jeep, and we got out of there. None of us really said much as we drove out of there. I went to the hospital soon after and found that I had broken my ankle. As I spent time recovering from the incident, I found myself unable to move past it. The words she had spoken just echoed endlessly in my mind. After all the rumors of monsters and demons that haunted the tunnels, could it really have been true? Was that really what had touched me that night? I can't explain it, but I felt like her words weren't just a threat. They sounded more like a desperate warning. 
Devon came over a few nights later, and I told him what I had seen. He was obviously skeptical at first, but after my continued insistence and swearing on my life, he finally came around. He admitted to me then that he had also found something disturbing. He said he was browsing 4chan when he stumbled upon a thread that caught his eye. He said a few users were talking about this human trafficking organization that operated all around the US. He said it quickly delved deep into conspiracies, talking about all sorts of prominent people that were supposedly involved with loose connections. There was one thing that stood out though. The butterfly. Apparently, Anon believed this butterfly symbol was like their specific symbol. Devon said the images they posted looked almost identical to the ones we had seen painted on the tunnels. I didn't want to believe it was connected, but I couldn't deny the possibility. I wanted to call the cops, but Devon refused, saying they'd never believe our story. He had a point. But if what we suspected was going on was true, then we had to do something. Unfortunately, my broken ankle made me practically useless, and regardless, there was just no way in hell I was going back down into those tunnels. Devon ended up leaving that night without us deciding on what to do. I tried calling Devon the next day, but he didn't answer. I figured he was just busy with other things, but a few days later, he finally got back to me. Devon texted me during the day, saying he desperately needed to see me. He was almost frantic when he arrived, and looked like he hadn't slept at all since the night we went down there. He kept saying he had to do something, seeming almost remorseful for his actions. He then did something I had never seen him do. He started to cry. I couldn't just leave it alone, man. Cops never would have believed us about all this. I had to do something. I put my hand on his back and tried calming him down, but it didn't seem to do much. Devon? What did you do? He shuddered and then took a deep breath as he wiped the tears. I went back. My eyes turned to reflect his mutual horror. What? I had to, man. I had to find her. To see. He broke down again, shaking his head back and forth. I found her. She's gone. Devon broke down again, and I actually hugged him as I tried reassuring that it wasn't his fault. None of it was. And yet, that didn't seem to stop the anguish from pouring into my gut. Devon also mentioned he had lit a large fire on the premises of the entry point as he left. He figured that would be enough to lure the cops there. And he was right. Eventually, they took a team down into the tunnels and discovered what we had feared the most. Multiple bodies were recovered from the tunnels, most of them young girls, but there were also a few men in the midst. They'd been down there a long time, with most of the corpses having long been become skeletal. Whoever it was that was responsible for their deaths was long gone. That would have been heartbreaking enough on its own, but then it got worse. They found one corpse that was much newer than the others, another young girl of 16, and although partially decomposed, they were able to identify her. She had been there about three months, and the autopsy confirmed all the most horrible things I had dreaded to hear. Things so terrible 
but I won't even justify them by putting them in words. Her name was Desiree. I looked up her full name online, and after doing some digging, I found her still active Facebook profile. Her friends and family had plastered her wall with well wishes and grief at her fate. She also had a video on there where her and some friends were on a trampoline messing around. My heart sank like a lead weight as I heard her speak. It was a voice I will never forget. The same voice of the girl that had spoken to me that night in the tunnels. But that was impossible as she had already been dead for weeks by the time we went down there. I don't know how to explain it, but I know what I heard. And now, I will never forget. The police investigation is still ongoing, but considering recent events of incompetence that have led to the apparent suicide of high-profile human trafficking operators, I wouldn't hold your breath. No doubt these people would just lay low for a while and then eventually spread their malice elsewhere. Portland is infamous for human trafficking and it seems this group may have been or still are at the epicenter. It's hard to say whether they'll ever be found and whether Desiree will ever have any form of justice. This revelation hit me pretty hard but not as hard as it hit Devon. I haven't seen or heard from him since that night he told me about all this. Last thing he said to me before he left was something along the lines of how, quote, something needs to be done. I don't know where he is now. I really wish I could give some kind of closure to all this, like there's some silver lining or justice for Desiree and all the others. But I guess things just doesn't always work out that way. For now, I can only hope that no one else has to suffer something as terrible as Desiree did. We set out on our little expedition into the tunnels, having heard stories of demons and monsters. We found out those stories are true but not in the way we expected. I know it sounds cliche, but it really is people that are the real demons, and it always has been. Beware the butterfly men, and stay far away from the Portland tunnels. The phone rang. There was no caller ID, so I almost let it go to voicemail. I expected it to be a sales call. On a lark, I answered it to give them a hard time about whatever unwanted items or service they were offering. Instead of that, I received a very sobering wake-up call. Get out of there immediately. The unknown caller blurted out, his out-of-breath delivery suggested an emotional investment in my well-being. I didn't expect that at all. The voice was hardly familiar, but the severity of his barked command was too distracting for me to focus on the message itself. Who is this? I demanded, tersely. The substance of the call, or how seriously I took it, depended wholeheartedly and finding out who was yelling at me. Never mind that. You don't have time to get wrapped up in anything at the moment. I'll explain later. Just leave the house immediately. Take the back door. Now. Hurry. I wasn't apt to take unsolicited advice or blind marching orders from random strangers, but there was a genuine authority in his voice. I decided to take it seriously. I picked up my wallet and darted out the back door, just as I had been instructed. 
I felt foolish at the time, but in hindsight, I'm glad I did it. As I was scurrying away from the back door like an obedient dog, it occurred to me that the whole thing might have been a clever ruse to get me out of the house. I was acting on the direction of an anonymous caller who, conveniently, knew something was about to happen. Stranger still, he just happened to have my phone number and wanted to reach out and warn me. I was about to dial the police with my suspicions when I heard sirens in the distance. I hadn't even pressed send. Miraculously, the cavalry was already on the way. At that instant, my phone buzzed in my hand again. What did I tell you? Keep walking and don't stop. Very bad individuals are on the way to your house. You need to be as far away as possible when they arrive. Are you in my house right now? I demanded. The police are already there, buddy. You better clear up before they get inside. The caller snorted with impatience. There's about to be a huge explosion. Why would I be inside for that? You need to be prepared for it. Crouch down and shield your ears. I'm serious as a heart attack about this. It's not a joke. It's going to go off in three, two, one. Boom. As if on cue, my house blew up with the dramatic violence of a blockbuster action movie. It was as if a bomb went off. The percussive wave knocked me to my knees from a quarter mile away. The sirens were blaring even louder than before and emergency vehicles were in the process of pulling up to the leveled ruins. I saw the twisted, smouldering remnant of my once beloved home and contemplated what the hell had just happened. I'd received a strange phone call. Against my better judgement, I heeded the cryptic warning from it. Three minutes later, my property was a charred crime scene. I was certain that I would be the prime suspect in its demise. My phone buzzed again, but this time, I completely ignored it. I was too dazed and stunned to answer. I began walking back home to identify myself to the authorities when the text tone dinged. In all of the confusion, I couldn't understand what I saw on the screen. It said the text came from my number and was sent to my number. Hey, are you alright? Do not go back in there. Do you hear me? Those aren't fire and rescue or the police. Right now, they are sifting through the wreckage looking to find your body. Here's the thing. They want to confirm you died in the blast because it suits their purpose. If you show yourself, they will kill you because they will know you didn't die. Do you understand? Everything was crazy and upside down all of a sudden. Nothing made any sense. This mystery individual just popped into my life and three minutes later, I was in the center of some violent espionage plot. No one would want to kill me. I knew that I wasn't important enough to draw that sort of reaction from anyone. I'm just an average guy. I immediately began to suspect the caller was actually the one trying to kill me. For fairly obvious reasons, I felt much safer revealing myself to dozens of emergency personnel congregated at my property than to the owner of the mystery voice on the phone who'd warned me. Was he really trying to convince me they were all in on some conspiracy and he was my real ally? All the official vehicles and government uniforms made the idea seem preposterous. The text dinged again. Unlike a phone call, it was harder to ignore. Stop walking toward them now, he demanded in frustration. If I was out to get you in any way, I would have just let you stay in the house, right? Trust me here, I have an important reason to protect you. Those people in the emergency suits do not 
have your best interests or welfare in mind. I do. The second text had the desired effect. I stopped, dead in my tracks, to weigh the pros and cons of his common sense explanation. He was absolutely right that I would be dead if he hadn't warned me, but I was still highly suspicious. I didn't feel I was important enough to merit all of the danger and intrigue I was being subjected to. Maybe it was all a bizarre ruse to build trust in him. Some criminals do opposite things like that for the long con. My phone rang again. Get in the damn bushes, now. They will see you, you dolt. He snarled furiously. It'll take them hours to sift through all that smoking debris. That gives you time to get far away from them. That is, if you don't get yourself shot standing around with a huge target on your back a hundred yards from the scene. They want you dead. Have you ever seen paramedics or firemen wear guns in the job? Look at the guy in the fire suit standing in your driveway. He's got an AK over his shoulder, right? I had to admit, the caller was right about that. Sheepishly, I muttered an affirmative. It definitely wasn't standard uniform issue for EMS staff. I also realized they weren't behaving like trained professionals looking to save lives. Lives like mine. They were acting odd. Do you think it would be wise to enter a fire with a loaded rifle on your back? No. They want to shoot you dead. Trust me. Back away slowly and walk through the woods until you reach Dortmund Road. Try to thumb a ride into town. You'll have to sleep on a park bench or something until daylight. Then go to the branch bank across the street as soon as it opens. I've set aside a nest egg for you. Ask for Mort. He'll know what to do. Just who are you? And why is all of this happening to me? I demanded. There was a long pause on the line. My unknown informant fell quiet all of a sudden. The incredibly familiar cadence of his voice resonated in my head, but I still couldn't place him. It was driving me crazy. His identity was on the tip of my tongue, but my brain just wouldn't let me figure it out because the real truth defied logic. If you think about it for a few minutes, I know you'll be able to figure it out, he suggested. Forget what's possible and just spit out who you think I sound like, he coaxed. You sound... Like me, I blurted out. I know that's a crazy thing to say, and it can't be true, but it's like hearing recordings of my own voice I've never heard before. We really have similar voices. Why couldn't I be you? The voice on the other end of the line inquired. It was such a preposterous question, I struggled to even respond to it at first. Because... I'm me, I blurted out. It goes without saying. Just drop the nonsense and tell me the truth. Who the hell are you? I'm you, John. I really am. Just three days from your time. I know it's hard to accept, but it's absolutely true. I was hesitant to tell you before because I didn't want to confuse you when it was really important that you get out of the house and run far away. I've already been through everything you are going through right now. Every single one of those things. But I didn't have the benefit of someone to call and warn me of what was about to go down. I... Uh, we... kind of stumbled our way through it the first time. But now, both versions of us are trapped in a tethered time loop. We were never meant to escape that gas explosion alive. Those people at the house are cleaners who correct timeline inconsistencies and screw-ups. I got lucky. I thought it was raining and the car windows were down. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this confusing conversation. But 
they were not down, I corrected with marked skepticism. I heard the weather forecast on the radio on the way home and rolled them up before I ever went inside. The cleaners added that to your experience of those events, he clarified. We were supposed to die in that explosion. When I managed to escape by spontaneously running outside to roll up the windows a moment before the gas line blew up, it messed up the schedule of the events for them. They added the newscast to your version of the circuit, so you'd stay inside and die in the blast. It was a way for them to correct things and end the fragmentation. I'd definitely be blown into pieces if I hadn't followed his urgent insistence, but none of what he said made any sense. How could an earlier version of myself warn me of anything? Just the thought made my head swim, but I prodded him to explain anyway. My future self-informant paused to recollect. After I ran out to close the car windows, the house exploded and I was blown clear of the debris. I awoke behind the holly bushes after the cleanup crew arrived. Just as I was about to call to them for help, I overheard one of them say they had to find and, quote, finish me off, quickly. That shut me up. My accidental survival caused a rift in time, and they had to reset things to ensure when the cycle started over, you stayed inside and died in the blast. I shuddered at his dreadful explanation. If he was telling the truth, and I had no reason to doubt him anymore, then forces beyond our comprehension wanted us dead. Worse than that, it wasn't even based on malice, so I wouldn't be able to negotiate them over. It was all part of maintaining some pragmatic grand design. The whole gloomy scenario was devastating. The future me continued. They knew I'd somehow survived because things were still out of order. It's their job to put everything back on schedule. I asked me how he'd managed to warn me through the hazy labyrinth of disjointed time loops. One of them was using this electric gizmo like a remote control to scan the area. At least, that's what it seemed like it was being used for. They aren't human, you know. They just have a humanoid appearance to blend in so they can fix mistakes. The gizmo holder set it down and I snatched it when he walked away. I figured it might prove useful. Then, I booked it out of there. After fooling around with it for a while, I figured out how to interfere with details in the loop. No doubt they'd love to get it back. It can literally control small periods of time. I marveled at the baffling chain of events I was embroiled in. What a nightmarish train wreck. Internally, I was proud of my future self for his initiative and ingenuity. He made me proud to be me. But the knowledge that they wanted to erase our mutual future filled me with a gnawing sense of fear and dread. I asked future me if we could ever meet in person to put our collective heads together. He laughed at my naivete. There's only one of us. You know that, right? You're just talking to a later version of yourself through a fragmented timeline portal, which shouldn't even be. The device I stole from them allows me to send you a message in a bottle via our phone. It's amazing I can call your version of our cell phone. It's only a matter of time before they realize I have this thing and trace it back to me through some form of triangulation. I may lose contact with you. If so, you're on your own. Good luck to... Um, earlier me. They want to erase all of this as if it never was. They want to smooth out the wrinkle in time that I caused by getting one of us back to the house to die. I don't know about you, but I wasn't ready to expire. We can fight this thing. Do you really think so? I asked, skeptically. 
they have powers and knowledge that we do not possess. We didn't even know they existed until you stumbled upon them. How can any human expect to compete with beings carrying out a grand, unknown design to maintain the singular, unified timeline? Great pep talk there, Junior. My future self deadpanned. I feel so much better now. Both of us started laughing at our own unique sense of sarcasm. What if you use that device to go back to the day before the explosion and fix the gas leak so there would be no need for them to undo any of this? Maybe they'll just allow us to carry on, once the preceding cause of the echo is eliminated. There was silence on the other end. For a moment, I was afraid they'd gotten to him, like he mentioned. Finally, he spoke. That's... actually a very good idea. Why didn't I think of that earlier? Technically, you just did, I offered. Both of us laughed again with an identical cadence you'd expect from two versions of the same person. He explained he was still figuring out how the device worked and how to operate it. I told him to stop making excuses and get to work. If I can figure out how to do that, and that's a big if, both of us will be eliminated and an earlier version of ourselves will have to stop the gas leak without the benefit of the knowledge of all these things we just discussed. How can we steer an even earlier us to save himself from their timeline cover-up? I thought long and hard about it. Can you send a text message or email to even earlier him, warning that version of us, without going into too much detail? You know as well as I do, we would never accept it without evidence or without actually living through the gas explosion and coming to terms with what's really going on. It's just got to be convincing enough that he attends to the gas leak. Future me was quiet again. How about if I use the time displacement device to back up this whole conversation and record it on my phone? I'll capture the conversation at the moment we started talking about it. From that recording, I can share the audio files with earlier us and he can hear the full explanation for himself. I agreed it might work, especially if he explained the nature of things on the recording. In the end, the only thing that mattered was for earlier me to have the gas leak fixed. It wouldn't matter if he believed the rest of it, especially since everything beyond that point would change after he followed through. I felt like it was a solid plan. It was then that future me admitted we were already on the second cycle of the conversation and he'd gotten it all recorded that time. Both of us wished our, even earlier self, good luck in undoing the disaster we were tangled up in. The following bizarre transcript was sent to me in a large audio file via a link in an email at first, I thought it was a spoofing or phishing scam, but when I sat down and listened to the recording, it absolutely sounded like me. Both sides of the conversation. It was uncanny, really. Of course, I didn't believe a single word of the preposterous scenario. It was the stuff of utter lunacy. But the sheer volume of effort it took to record long periods of my speaking voice to fabricate the complicated testimony was staggering. I was thoroughly impressed by their noteworthy effort. I wondered at what end the hoaxes hoped to gain from such a complex forgery and crazy tale. It's almost always about stealing someone's money, but I really don't have much to steal. Out of whimsical curiosity, I had my gas lines checked anyway. Now I'm certain it was only a ridiculous coincidence, but they did find a serious gas leak in my oven. Had I not acted on that irrational curiosity, the natural gas company employee said it would have proven fatal. As a person of both logic and science, however, I can tell you the bizarre email I received from Future Self One was complete hogwash. 
I know the recording is fabricated for unknown nefarious purposes, but there's still a small part of me that wonders about it. Do I owe future self one and two my literal undying gratitude for detailing their efforts to save me from them, whoever they are? I guess I'll never know the real truth unless I see EMTs nearby with assault rifles over their shoulders. And lots of people are afraid of needles. It's a pretty common fear. I wouldn't say I'm the worst to deal with it. I don't have raging panic attacks and I've never fainted. But I do work up my anxiety pretty significantly before I have to go get one. And I almost always streak my face with a tear or two as soon as I see the needle. Sometimes before it even comes anywhere near me. I could even work myself into a mild panic attack the day before if I don't have anything to distract me during the day. It's especially bad in the evening when all my brain can do is play out scenarios of how terrible the next day is going to be over and over again in my head. I remember when I was a kid, there was a mandatory shock we had to get. I cried silently behind the permission slip the teacher had deposited on my desk to take home and cried every night for a week until the day. I was miserable. I'm better with needles now that I'm older. I'm an adult now. And there are some things you just force yourself to do, even if you don't want to. And it's usually better to just get it over with. I still get a bit emotional and stressed, but I'm pretty conscious of the doctor or nurse who's doing it. It's not their fault I have to get a needle, and I don't want to make their job harder than it probably already is. I try to stay as still as I can and not tense up. I prompt them ahead of time that I'm scared and won't be actively talking to them, and usually the procedure goes smoothly, even if I end up a bit of a mess. I have trouble even pinpointing what part of the experience triggers me. I know sometimes it's necessary. I know in my mind, logically, it doesn't even hurt. I trust most medications, and I know that serious side effects are rare. So it's not even the after effects. It's just something about the way the needle is so small and innocent. But once you feel it pierce through your skin and inject something into your body, it feels a little violating. Just the overall experience of getting a needle triggers me on a visceral level, and I can't really control the anxiety and emotional reaction I have to it. If I absolutely need to get a needle, I'll do it. But if it's up to my discretion, often I'll refuse. The only exception I made recently was for an optional vaccination but that was because I more predominantly refused to be lumped in with the anti-vaxxers that were plaguing the internet at the time. I suffered through that shot like a champ. Priorities, you know. Get your vaccines, kids. Unfortunately, this is my only experience with tiny needles like vaccines, and blood-drawing needles are another story entirely. I once had a meltdown in a doctor's office several years ago because I wasn't prepared for her to suggest I get blood work done. My terror and anxiety kicked into high gear and I immediately burst into tears and told her I wouldn't do it. I went home an emotional mess that day and it was an embarrassing ordeal. I mentally brace myself ahead of time now so I don't freak out if they happen to suggest it. It's not the end of the world, and usually it's optional, so I don't have to get it done anyway. It hasn't been absolutely necessary for me to get my blood drawn since I was very young. I don't even remember it, but according to my parents, I did get blood work done at one point. Whether that was because I was too young to remember, or because I purposely blocked the experience from my brain, I'll never know. A while back, 
My doctor wanted me to get a blood test done for some random strain of measles or something. Just in case, they said. I took the paperwork to be polite, and after a week of it sitting on my desk, I threw it out, knowing I wouldn't be able to convince myself to go. It wasn't very adult of me, but I couldn't justify a tiny what-if for an experience that would grant me significant emotional misery for very little payoff. This week, I went to the clinic with an odd pain in my chest. I have a few different diseases on my father's side of the family, thyroid and diabetes, and though I thought it was probably just stress from a hard work week and an upcoming project I needed to prepare for, I went to get it checked out anyway. The doctor at the clinic was stumped, prodding at the area where the muscle throbbed dully. It didn't hurt much, but it was odd that it seemed to be aching for no particular reason. He nodded along as I briefly stated my family medical history and I mentioned that I didn't recall straining it in any way either. After a few strange tests, testing my vision and feeling around on my neck, I figured he must be checking for either of those diseases that ran in my family. As he left my side and wandered over to his computer, tapping away and entering a few notes, I braced myself. I knew what was coming. I haven't had any symptoms of thyroid or diabetes my whole life, but I knew if he was thinking about it at that moment, what it entailed. Here's a form to go get a blood test. These checked boxes just tell us how many vials they need to get. Most of these are checking for thyroid, but we'll check your blood for glucose as well, just in case. I'm not exactly sure what's causing it, but the test will hopefully shine some light on our next steps. The lab is just down the road. You know where it is? He asked, his attention more directed towards the computer than to me. Yeah... I know where it is, I muttered, a tinge of defeat and bitterness hanging off my words. This didn't sound optional. I took the paperwork and climbed into my car. It sat on the passenger seat, staring at me. I didn't drive to the lab. I drove home. I called my regular doctor and asked her to forward me the paperwork from several months ago, telling the secretary that I'd lost it and I was going to get some other blood work done. I figured if I had to go, I'd get everything that everyone wanted done and out of the way. Two birds with one stone. Plus, if the secretary forgot about my request and didn't send me the paperwork, I could use that as an excuse to not go and get it done at all. Unfortunately, the paperwork was sitting in my email the next morning. I sighed, printing it out and glancing at the time. Early afternoon seemed like a decent time to go. It was midweek and shouldn't be too busy around lunchtime. I steeled myself and hopped in the car, driving over to the labs. I could feel the ache in my jaw from clenching it and I tried to manually relax myself by breathing slowly on the way over. I couldn't do very much about my heartbeat, which I could feel thumping through my veins at an uncomfortable speed. The anxiety rose up in my throat like bile, but I managed to fight it back most of the way. I arrived at the labs and wandered in, scanning the waiting room. One old woman in a bright pink shirt, a tattooed couple with colourful hair and two rambunctious children. I nervously stepped up and answered the questions of the secretary, her words settling my anxiety momentarily with the distraction. I handed over my paperwork and health card. Might as well do it all at once because I don't do this very often. I smiled at the woman tightly. She seemed sympathetic, realizing my stress. It'll be all right, she hummed reassuringly. I sat down to wait, 
and try to not look at how much time I had on the TV showing the waiting list order. I could feel my anxiety creeping up the back of my neck once again. The two children were misbehaving, one screeching and the other trying to walk into the rooms where others were taking their turns. The old woman was piping up every few minutes, asking when it was her turn and if she was indeed there to get her blood work and not something else. The nurses patiently told her it would only be a bit longer. The noise didn't help my stress levels and I opened up a game on my phone to try and occupy my mind with something else. I only checked the waiting list once and the 10 minutes message behind my name spiked my anxiety so hard I had to slip into the washroom and drink some water from the tap. It always felt like it washed down some of the unease that crawled up my spine and sat in the back of my throat, if only temporarily. I sat back down and tried not to fidget. They finally called my name and I forced myself to walk into the first room that one of the nurses gestured to. I saw the same kind woman I spoke to at the desk pick up a clipboard with my room number on it. I hadn't even realized that the three women milling around the desk were multitasking as both secretaries and nurses. She walked into the room, shutting the door and glancing at me with a smile. I began my rehearsed lines. Hey, I'm afraid of needles and I might look away. I might cry too, was left unsaid. I already felt my eyes welling up and I willed it away, keeping my jaw tight and breathing through my nose. Oh dear, it's alright. Is there anything I can do to help? She chose not to address the tear that slipped out and down my cheek. How polite. Not really. This always happens. Don't tell me what you're doing or when you're doing it. Just get it over with and I'll be okay. I replied tersely, the emotion and anxiety choking me like I just tried to swallow a bagel whole. She nodded and handed me back my health card. I snapped out of my freak out a little as I grabbed my wallet and sat it out with my card on the table. I didn't look back at her, instead looking at one of the posters on the wall as she went through emotions. Take a deep breath in. I clenched my teeth hard, but obeyed through my nose, tears slipping out as I felt the needle sink into my elbow. It took a few minutes, but I finally let out a shuddering breath as I felt her slip the needle out and put a cotton pad on. All done. I finally looked back and she smiled gently at me. I smiled tightly back as my fear hadn't really subsided yet. I distracted myself by looking at the newly filled vials. Blood didn't bother me. She had four of them, and was sticking on some labels with my information. I was surprised how quickly those four vials filled up. I think the entire process must have only taken a few minutes. She instructed me to put pressure on the cotton and after a couple more minutes, stuck a piece of tape over it. I stood up, and she said if I felt okay and not dizzy, I could leave. I nodded, my eyes still a bit red and puffy, but my anxiety subsiding. I thanked her and left the room, closing the door behind me as I left, keeping my head down, assuming she probably needed to do a bit more prep work before she took the next person. I was almost out of the building when I remembered my wallet sitting on the table in the room. I spun around with a sigh and trotted back to the lab, walking through the waiting room back over to the room I'd been in. I'd only been gone a few moments, so I pushed the door open. Sorry, I... My gaze shifted over to the nurse and I froze. 
it was the same nurse, but with crazed-looking, reptilian features. Slit yellow eyes looked sideways at me. A vial of blood raised to its mouth. It hung open, wider than I'd ever seen anyone's jaw ever stretch. A long, snaking tongue was inside the vial, blood dripping down. My blood. I let out a noisy breath and blinked. My, my wallet, I sputtered, blinking a few more times as I processed the new scene with confusion. In a flash, it had changed. The nurse was back to normal. The vial was empty, and she had lifted it higher, one eye closed and the other squinting into it. She put it down, looking over at the table. Ah, yes. I didn't see you'd forgotten it. Sorry, I thought I saw a smudge in this one. Have to keep everything sterile, right? She smiled at me, serene. My mind was reeling, and I reflexively nodded, reaching over and grabbing my wallet, glancing slyly at the plastic tray that contained my vials. I tried to smile, but I'm sure my face was screwed up, baffled, raw and red. Uh, thanks, I rasped out, hurrying from the room and shutting the door behind me. The other two secretaries were looking at me with similar, calm smiles. I held my breath and offered them what I hoped was a polite nod, flashing them the wallet in my hand that I hoped conveyed why I briefly returned. I resisted the urge to run and shouldered my way out of the building. The second my door shut behind me, I rattled out a terrified sob and hacked out a cough from holding my breath and clenching my jaw. I tried to slow my ragged breathing as I drove carefully home, eyes on my rearview mirror the entire way. When I left that first time, I distinctively remember four vials. When I glanced into that plastic tray as I left for the second time, I only saw three. The family lake house sits along the southern edge of Lake Champlain in Vermont, tucked away behind rolling green hills. I used to spend every year here when I was a boy. I've watched the trees dance with the wind for days, waiting. I spent most of my years struggling as a failed writer. I worked meaningless, dead-end jobs, staying up all night writing I spent countless hours going down the lists of magazines and publishers accepting work. Much to my misfortune, I never made any progress. My stories sat for years in a meaningless pile, in an unmarked folder on my desktop. I used to look at that folder as if it were the North Star. Yet, as my submissions remained unanswered, my guiding star's light began to fade. It faded to black, oozing with disdain. With my inbox gathering cobwebs, I felt my ideas start slipping away. I used to write to escape. I'd use it as a metaphorical means to pack my bags, get on a plane or a boat to wherever I created. In my mind, I could go anywhere. I sat in my lonesome apartment, staring at the computer screen, forgetting how to formulate words. I had nothing. Nowhere to escape. I winced over the brightness of another blank page on my screen in the dark. I took a small sip of the iced whiskey on my left, contemplating everything. As the burning waves crashed down into my belly, I heard a soft knock on my closet door. Hello? It was coming from inside. 
three more knocks, deliberately slow, taunting me with its pace. Who's there? One solid knock came from behind the door, shaking the hinges and rattling the frame. A memory exploded in my mind, causing the ocean of whiskey in my belly to surge back up into my throat. One knock for yes, two knocks for no. No, it couldn't be. It's been years. I'd escaped it for so long. I slammed my laptop shut and blinked forcefully, hoping it would help my eyes adjust to the darkness. Whatever was behind that door felt patient, as if it had been already waiting for years. Who's there? I asked. The silence left a heavy feeling in the air, resurfacing memories I'd spent so much time forcing out of my consciousness, desperately trying to escape from, were flooding back to me. Those aren't the rules, Noah. Yes or no questions only, remember? I gathered the strength to follow the rules, afraid that the unsettling patience of the presence behind my closet door was wearing thin. Is it really you? It was a question I shouldn't have asked. I didn't want to know the answer, but my mouth spewed the words before I could decide. That heavy feeling in the air shattered like broken glass with a sound. Knock, which meant yes. I shot up out of my chair and slammed into the desk, sending the laptop and whiskey crashing to the floor. I ran my sweaty hand along the wall, desperately searching in the dark for the light switch. I flicked it up and down, frantically calling for the light, except the switch wouldn't work. The darkness remained, setting the perfect stage for the moon to shine a narrow beam of light through my window. My eyes remained fixed on the door, as the moonlight lit up the slats of the closet door on cue. I could see a dark, shadowy figure watching me behind them. A wet, gurgling sound left my skin ice cold. I could see water pooling through the bottom of the door. Leave me alone, I screamed, fumbling around the room, searching for pants and shoes. The closet door rattled ferociously from the force of the two knocks that followed. Knock, knock, which meant no. No, 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 I'm not doing this again, I won't. With every no came one resounding slam in defiance, telling me, no, demanding, yes, 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 yes you are, yes you will. I spent the rest of that entire night driving up here to the lake house, remembering. Noah, let's play the game again, Jake said excitedly, nudging my arm. Come on, that was so much fun last time. I was so scared. He looked up at me. Eyes were wide in anticipation, sipping the straw of his apple juice through a tight smile. Yeah, who will be the drowned boy this time? I yelled back, just as excited as he was. I want to be the drowned boy. You got to do it last time. Before I could even respond, Jake bolted up the stone path from the lakeside to the back door of the lake house. I ran to try and follow, but his little feet sputtered as he beat me inside and into our bedroom closet. Oh man, I hate being on the other side. It's boring. Come on, Jake. A few knocks came from the back of the closet door. He was laughing but it sounded really strange, almost as if he were choking on a sip of his juice box. Um, 
Are you old? Knock, knock. So, you're a kid. I wonder how old you are. Do you live here too? Knock. But we live here. How come I haven't seen you? Are you dead? There's a dramatic pause. Jake had a flair for the dramatic. It came natural to him. Knock. The knock caught me off guard. Whoa, you scared me. Do you want to be friends? Knock. We should go hang out by the lake, I said, and flung open the doors to the closet. That was usually the end of the game. Except, when I opened the doors, there was no one there. Jake ran into the room behind me, gasping for air. Oh man, you aren't going to take my spot, are you? Mom stopped me for a snack. Were you practicing? Jake said, chewing something chocolatey. You know, you really do suck at asking the questions. Want a teddy gram? The closet doors behind me slammed shut, sending a strong gust of wind against my back. Jake stared behind me, slack-jawed and confused. Is Dad playing? He said. No, I thought you were in there. I didn't give any notice to my job or my landlord that I'd come here. I left everything in my apartment, aside from a few pairs of clothes and my laptop. Something tells me I may not need any of it anymore. It's time to face the past. This is where I need to be, whether I wanted this or not. Maybe I can bend like these trees in the wind and dance with the darkness that awaits me here at the lake house. I watched the shoreline on the lake from the back window during the sunset yesterday. It used to feel so serene, leaving me in a timeless state of acceptance, in awe of the ripples in the water from the wind. The shoreline is moving now. I can see it coming closer. It happened so fast. I watched the clock as the sun was slowly lassoed in by the horizon. In one hour, the lake had covered what must have been at least ten feet of ground. The pier where our family boat was docked is still standing, but now there's no way to walk onto it without going into the water. That night, I had a nightmare that I couldn't get away from. I would wake up soaked in sweat just to fall back asleep right where I'd left off. Noah? Jake's voice was shaky. What's up? I was fishing on the shore of the lake. I wasn't any good yet, but my dad was, and he bought me my very own rod and reel to practice. He told me, Use your wrist to flick the rod up as you release and look up at the trees. You'll be a pro in no time. It was pretty good advice, I thought because when I looked at the trees, my lord didn't smash through the water like it was before. It soared through the sky, and I loved the sound of the reel as the line let out. Look, look out there. What's wrong with you, Jake? Are you okay? I asked as I turned to him. He was pointing out into the lake. Do you see him? Jake was trembling. See who? It's him. Who, Jake? You're scaring me. His eyes were stuck on the water. He didn't blink at all. It's the drowned boy, he said, still not blinking. From our game, he wants to play with you. He doesn't want to swim at the bottom of the lake anymore. 
I looked out of the water and saw a small, black mess of hair floating in the center of the lake. It was slowly floating up, higher and higher, revealing the moldy, rotted face of a boy, smiling. I screamed and turned back to Jake to grab him, throw him over my shoulder and run to the house. As I went to pick him up, he felt wet. I must not have noticed, but it was no longer Jake that was standing next to me. My fingers dug deep into the sides of soggy fabric, and they easily sunk through even further through the flesh. I looked up to see the same face that was just watching us from the water, his matted black hair messy over his eyes. His skin was grey and old, and sunk loosely over his bones. He tried to speak to me, but all I could hear was a low, guttural, gurgling sound from deep within his throat. Noah! Noah! Jake's trailing scream sent a shock down my spine. I looked back out at the water to see my brother splashing in the center of the lake, helplessly trying to stay afloat. Finding courage through instinct, I pushed the boy away from me and ran towards the lake. I jumped in head first and swam towards him as fast as I possibly could. I'm coming, keep treading Jake, remember kick your feet just like dad said. I was screaming the words between each dive of my head as I swam. I can't, I can't. Can't stay above water. Jake was already swallowing too much water. It t- working. Keep kicking, Jake. Come on, I'm almost there. I felt the tears welling up in my eyes, even in the water. I was trying so hard to get to him and bring him back to the shore. I was closing the distance between us when I saw his arms shoot up into the air as his body plunged hard into the water. Bubbles erupted from the surface and it was all I saw until I went under. I dove down to find Jake and pull him back up. I knew I was close enough to still save him. I kicked my arms and legs hard, sending my body forward faster than I have ever swam before. I never knew how deep the lake was. The bottom seemed to go on for miles, and the blackness made me feel like I was just a guppy in an ocean of terror. I saw Jake in front of me, still plummeting further down into the darkness below. So many bubbles were coming from his open mouth. I could still hear my name, even here. He was still calling for me. There was a hand made of bone wrapped tightly around his ankle. The boy was here with us, there with him, taking him down, drowning him. I reached out to him to no avail. I was still too far. He kept sinking lower and lower until I couldn't see him anymore. Eventually, I couldn't even see the bubbles. Just like that, he was gone. Jake was gone. The nightmares rained on, and the water is seeping through the crack at the bottom of the back door. A soft, confident sound of running water pulled me out of my dreams. Water was coming into the living room from the back end of the house, traveling through the entire ground floor. 
I dunked my feet into the water. My breath stopped dead in his tracks from the cold. The current was strong. I struggled to stay on my feet, taking small, deliberate steps forward. A familiar, mousy voice called for me from upstairs. My heart panged. Noah? Hey, Noah! Jake? I know you're down there, bro. Come up and play. I shuddered at the words. I couldn't fight back the tears, or the prickly goosebumps that enveloped my being. Footsteps pitter pattered down the hall above me, in the direction of our old room, to the closet. I wasn't naive enough to think things could ever go back to the way they were. I think I knew Jake was his now, but I didn't want to face it. I heard a door slowly creak open before slamming shut. I'm coming, buddy. Hang tight. I yelled as I headed up the stairs. When the authorities couldn't find Jake's body, I wasn't surprised. The drowned boy took him, and he wasn't going to let them take Jake away from him. But now... I was back, and I wasn't going to leave my brother again. I turned at the top of the steps and headed down the hall. When I got to our bedroom, I saw the closet door. The knocking already began. Come on, Noah, Jake said. It's me and our friend in here this time. I really didn't want to share, but he wouldn't let us play alone. I told him it would be super confusing, so he agreed to take turns. Okay, if we have to. I didn't want to share either. He'd had him for so long. I'm going to go first. You get to ask me three questions, then it's his turn. Choose wisely. Okay, go. I didn't waste any time. Are you okay, buddy? Knock. I've missed you so much. Do you miss me? Knock. Do you want to come home with me and get out of here? Knock. Those three questions went so fast. I wish I had more. But... I wasn't making the rules. Yet even so, I wasn't afraid anymore. I was there for Jake, and I needed to be strong for him. I spoke to the boy, not playing by the rules, but speaking my mind. I had so much to say to him that I kept bottling up inside for years. I want to keep playing with Jake, I really don't want to ask you any questions. I only want to tell you things. So many things about how I feel. So, here it is. I hate you. I hate that you ruined my life. I hate you for taking my brother from me. I don't know what happened to you. I'm sorry for whatever it was, but it doesn't give you any right to take Jake away from me. I was inching closer and closer to the closet door, so close that my face was almost touching. I heard the gurgling sounds of the boy, and I could feel his presence. He sounded angry with me, but I didn't care. We would have played with you, played this game whenever you wanted, but you were selfish. You had to take him all for yourself. I heard sirens making their way down the long stretch of road up to the lake house. They were quickly gaining traction as I stared at the closet door. There was a new knock, this time loud and urgent, coming from downstairs. 
He was becoming quicker, more furious with every second. I was halfway down the steps when I heard his muffled voice. Noah, open that damn door. I know you're in there, goddammit. Open the goddamn door before I take it off the hinges. Dad. I ran down the remaining steps and raced to the front door. I quickly turned back the deadbolt and began to turn the knob. Before I could pull back the door, it smashed me in the face, sending me backwards. I expected the water to break my fall, but the floor was bone dry. Noah, it's time to go back home, son. You've been gone long enough, my father said, sobbing, his eyes red and drained of happiness. I sat up from the floor, rubbed the back of my head and winced, trying to comprehend his words. Why are you all wet? What's going on here? I got to my feet. Jake's here. I was just playing with him upstairs, like old times, I said to him, reaching out to grab his arm and lead him upstairs. My father ripped his arm away from my hand. Jake's gone. You know what happened. We've gone over this so many times. Let's take him home. Why can't we just take him home? Because he's dead, Noah. He's been dead for years, and I have to try to convince myself every day not to hate you for it. There was a blackness in his eyes as they narrowed. I tried to save him. I tried to swim out to him and bring him back up, but he was being pulled down by the drowned boy, I exclaimed. My father was becoming angrier with each word. That's enough about this drowned boy. Do you know what happened? When I came outside after hearing the screams, you had your hand pressed down over his head in that lake. I could see the veins in his neck swelling as he screamed. You weren't bringing him up. You were pushing him down. You were killing him. No, that's wrong. It's okay, Dad. I know it's hard, I said softly, trying to calm him down. He tried to take me too, but I wasn't going to let him take us both. My father let out a short chuckle under his breath and sneered. Well, how convenient for you. Funny how that works, huh, Noah? The guilt must be too much for you. You just can't own up to it. It wasn't true. It couldn't be. Flashes of red and blue lights were coming through the window. I pulled apart the blinds and looked out at them. There were two police cars behind my father's old Camaro. My mom was sitting in the passenger seat. She was hunched over with her face in her hands. I could tell. She was crying. I turned back to my father. Dad, just come upstairs with me for one minute and I'll show you. You'll see. He's up there waiting for me to come back. God, what did I do to deserve this? My father asked, looking up to the ceiling. He looked back down to me and nodded solemnly. Okay, but for one minute. But after that... We are going. The police are waiting. I led him upstairs to the closet. There was a wet, decrepit smell consuming the air that wasn't there before. I gagged as I opened the closet doors to find Jake lying curled tight on the floor. His body long since rotted and decayed. There were muddy footprints everywhere. The closet door handles were wet and brown. When my father dragged me away and out of that house, my eyes followed the trail of wet mud 
that led from the closet down the stairs. It went out the back door, and I could see them leading to the lake as they placed me inside the back of a police car. I started to wonder who the drowned boy really was. Did he even exist? Was it me all along? I stare at these padded white walls, wondering. It's all I'm allowed to do since I've been back. When the hospital notified my parents that I was gone, my father checked the old apartment that my parents used to rent out. It looked as if someone had been squatting, living in filth and darkness, but no one was there. He told me that he found a picture of me and Jake sitting on the floor next to an old, dirty mattress in the center of the bedroom. He stayed awake every night waiting for me, hoping maybe I'd come home. But I never did. I wish things could be different. I hear the knocks on the door of my room every night. I'm told not to listen, that they aren't real. I'm told so many things that I don't believe. But they're the professionals. My parents tell me to listen because they know what's best. Knock, knock, knock. They're becoming louder, but no one else hears them. I try again to run, but the restraints are so tight that I can't move. Knock, 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 knock. They tell me every day not to play. But I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't. If I keep playing, it'll never stop, they say. If I stop, Jake will be gone forever. This is all I have to stay connected to him. Hello? The knocking calmed, but continued. Is that you, Jake? Knock. I'm sorry I had to leave. I tried to be with you. Are you okay? Knock. Knock. I frowned. Are you upset with me? Knock. Please don't be. I promise I tried. They brought me back here. I was going to stay. A loud, fierce knock came from the wall on the other side of the room. Jake, are you still there? Knock. I barely heard Jake's knock as it was drowned by knocks on the walls all around me. I could even hear them coming from the floor below. Are you... alone? Knock. 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 